we're focused in on the orbit model that focuses more on the early stages of intervention development, right? So the um, sort of rationale and picking targets for change and all that kind of stuff. So if you remember, this is the NIH stage model. As I said, it sort of um, talks a bit more about uh, how we go to effectiveness more from community-based efficacy trials rather than sort of research university-based trials and it focuses on implementation and we're going to get to that in a couple of classes more of the implementation piece and this is the orbit model um, that we talked about so we spent quite a bit of time um, here at the beginning the, the research question um, defining what our research question is and then looking at what our kind of uh, outcome is that we want to achieve and how it should be clinically meaningful um, and then how we would go about defining the critical elements of our intervention and then um, we're going to talk a bit more about refining um, and doing proof of concept stuff. Um, so if we, we don't move to refine until we have got a proposed pathway of how your intervention works. Right? So say we use that example of fatigue, you know, we think it works through um, muscular conditioning or whatever it is. Um, and we have treatment components, so what are going to be all the elements, you know, we're we going to have group support, we're we going to have psychoeducation, we're we going to have the exercise component, whatever it is, and then targets for each component. So this model proposes that we have a target, so if you have a component on home practice, you need a target for home practice. If you have a component on social support, you have a target for social support or measure for that. So measuring outcomes for each component, and that the endpoint should be clinically meaningful. So we say, you know, if our primary thing is fatigue, we are going to work on our intervention until we can reduce fatigue by a clinically significant amount. And if we don't get there, then we stop. We try something else, right? And in phase 1B is where we test the components together for the first time. And here's where we explore the delivery mode, the person who delivers it, you know, how many sessions we need to have, how long the session should be, if there's home practice, the format. So this phase 1B is where we do a lot of this testing. Um, and we want to find ways to do it that are more efficient. And so this is where um, the different designs come in, where we're going to talk about factorial. We're not even going to get into fractional factorial, but I'm just going to talk, focus quite a bit on a factorial design. Because some people might be really familiar with this sort of two-by-two two design from psychology, but we're going to take it a, a step further. So we're going to review it first, and then we'll see how it applies in this context of refining your intervention, optimizing interventions. We're going to talk about the most framework, it's called. And then I'll spend some time at the end um, on adaptive designs. So these are the new sexy things now. I don't know if you've heard of oh, what's an adaptive design. You probably don't know what it means, right? Um, I turns out I've been doing adaptive designs and didn't even know it. <laughs> okay, so I haven't technically been doing them because they're supposed to be planned in advance. Um, but whenever you change any element of your trial partway through, you're adapting it, and that's an adaptive design. So you can plan to adapt, um, and that's technically an adaptive. Design. And they also talked about things like you could use case series here, um, modeling and simulations, which I had no idea what they were talking about, but now that I've learned more about adaptive designs, I actually know what they mean about all this modeling. And we're not going to get into that because it's very high level statistics, but just sort of how it might be used. So um, the interesting thing here that you can use to optimize your intervention is called this multi phase optimization strategy or MOST. Um, and it's a woman named Linda Collins, and she has a whole sort of business made out of this. Um, so most is uh, comprehensive, principled, engineering-inspired, meaning it's very precise, I suppose, framework for optimizing and evaluating multi-component behavioral interventions. So it's specifically for behavioral interventions and specifically for interventions that have more than one component. Um, and so the ones that we do typically are multi-component, so the mindfulness would be, you know, the Tai Chi, even though you think you're just doing one thing, you're not, right, because you've got components of, um, say, there's group practice, there's at-home practice, there's some form of teaching, there's some form of education, right, there's all sorts of different things, there may be, like, in the mindfulness, there may be the sitting meditation, there may be um, the informal mini meditation practices we do, there's the yoga, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, so most includes randomized controlled trials when you get further down through the process. I'll show you the diagram in a minute. But it also spends a lot of time talking about the earlier phases of research before you get to the RCT. So it sort of fits really well with that orbit model in the sort of phase one and into phase two. So they sort of fit together nice. And the idea with most is to optimize your intervention before you launch into the big expensive trial. So 
this is what the little diagram looks like, another one. Um, so you can kind of map it on. The preparation, that's like the very beginning of the orbit model where you're doing your basic science. Um, the part we're going to talk about now is the optimization, in this box here. So the way it's defined is that the black boxes are actions. This one here is information output or input. Here's where you make a decision, whether you're going to go ahead or not go ahead. And of course, there's not as much attention to the end on this one, right? So you're optimizing it. We're going to talk about that. How do you come up with the best intervention that's got just the right number of sessions, just the right components, that's going to maximize improvement on those already predetermined clinical markers, right? Um, so if you think it's going to be effective after you've optimized it, you go into evaluation. And in this framework, evaluation, that's your RCTs, right? That's your traditional phase three kind of thing. And if it's effective there, well, then you release it. And what happens? Well, the whole world uses it? Well, no. <laughs> so I, in my mind, this model falls down there, right? Because, you know, just because you developed an optimized intervention and it's perfect and you release it doesn't mean that anyone's going to use it, right? So we're going to talk, because that's that valley of death, right? Um, so this framework is great about optimizing your intervention, getting a really good intervention, um, but has very little to say about how you're going to get that out and people using it once you've developed it. But I yeah. mean, for example, when we use outcomes like salivary cortisol or <coughs> telomeres, like there's no like epidemiological data that says that this is the most clinically meaningful. So it's not a good outcome. Okay. It's just not a good outcome. It's useful because, for example, you may want to, you know, choose the treatment components that maximally decrease cortisol, if that's what you think is clinically important, right? But you have to have, you know, so say you want, you have to know what it is you're looking for, right? right? So maybe you want your inflammatory markers to go down. And so you can, again, use the most framework that we're going to talk about, and that could be one of the outcomes, and you can choose the treatment components that, you know, most optimally affect those, mm -hmm. but that's not going to be the decision point about whether or not it's useful, right? It's going to be more, does your fatigue go down? Like go your down, clinical yeah. endpoints, yeah. right? Your clinical endpoints are always going to be more important. Any other questions about this framework? Okay. So we're going to talk about this factorial design because this is what most is um, based on. And I'm going to show you a little video in a second too. But most people will have learned early on in statistics about your two by two factorial. So it's um, your factors are your dependent <coughs> variables. Uh, sorry, they're your independent variables. I put DVs instead of IVs. Um, and they're fully crossed and combined into one experiment. So in the example here, I use an exercise example. So here, your um, intervention is either aerobic or resistance exercise. And they're either doing it at home or they're doing it in a group um, coming into the center. Right, so in a factorial design, you'll have each of these four conditions, so that they do aerobic exercise at home, and they do resistance exercise at home. And then they also do aerobic exercise as a group, and resistance exercise as a group. Okay, and this um, is a bit different than your randomized controlled trial, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, but the idea is that they're fully crossed, so that each factor has two levels, um, and each level is crossed with the other. So we get four groups. Why do we do this? Because we can test multiple variables in one experiment, and it turns out you need fewer subjects, and I'll show you why. And it's more economical, way faster, and way easier, and cheaper than an RCT, but it can answer a lot of the same research questions. So I'm going to let this guy really explain the factorial design. Oops, where did he go? There he is. Um, with a funny example, sort of funny. This one is on factorial designs. A little bit more complex design, and I, I will try, as I did in the last one, to give you an interesting topic on which to do this. I use pictures, and I manipulated them a little bit. In this case, as you can see, I've got a picture of me in the upper left side, and then using the magic of hair mixer, I put a little hair in myself. <laughs> so uh, I would have to play around with the idea that one of these guys is attractive, and one of them is ordinary. Uh, how this tender. hair color affected our perceptions? We know that attractive people are afforded all kinds of advantages in, in our society. However, did you know 
There are some situations in which being attractive actually works to your disadvantage. And the situation I'm going to look at is this. If you are accused of a crime, okay, so here's one of my upcoming independent variables, type of crime. If you're accused of a crime, not surprisingly, attractive people tend to get uh, lower sentences. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to move things around a little bit because I'm going to look at another thing. All right, so I guess I'm going to look at attractiveness, and we've got the ordinary uh, here. Now I'm going to move this around because I'm going to create a new design here. And here's the attractive guy. So attractive people, lower length of sentences, unless they use their attractiveness in the committing of the crime. So, for example, if you, instead of a typical crime, which will use a robbery, what if the crime was a swindle? In other words, you, you are a man, in this case, let's say, and you use a, you uh, swindle a somewhat older woman, let's say, out of her money by pretending to like her. Now, in that case, if you are attractive, you will get a longer sentence as a result, right? Because you used your attractiveness, and that's where we sort of, you know, there's, there's also, of course, a certain hidden envy about pe people who are attractive, and so when we have a chance, it's sort of tied into how we like to see the mighty fall, right? We're, we're, yeah, that kind of thing, which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with as well. Um, <clears throat> so if you're attractive, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a copy of Mr. Attractive here. Actually, I think, he's, I think I called him Mr. Swarmy in the previous episode, but whatever. So now I have a four-condition experiment, right? So I'm going to bring subjects in, give them a picture to look at of a person who committed a crime, and this is, an, this is a between subjects design, so you don't know that there are four conditions and two different looking people. You just come in, you see one picture, you read about the crime that person committed, and then I ask you to um, you know, assign a sentence. How long should the, uh, this person spend in jail? And probably I give you some guidelines because uh, young students may not know what is typical. But within there, I'm sure I'm going to, I'm going to allow students to uh, have plenty of room uh, to, to decide on the length of the sentence. So it's getting a little bit, uh, a little bit more complicated, I suppose, than, than the previous design because there are all kinds of possibilities here. So I'm going to give you some possible outcomes for each of these um, conditions. And again, that is the dependent variable is the length of the sentence as measured in months. Okay. So get rid of that. Here's some hypothetical results. Um, here we have, we, if for condition number one, up upper left, okay, ordinary looking guy commits a robbery, I'm going to say that they're going to, my hypothetical subjects, are going to give this person 5.1 on average months in jail. Okay. And hopefully I've got a good number in there, 20, 30 students, optimally somewhere in there. So I've got 30 times <coughs> four, I've got 120 subjects. So already you can see you know, a factorial design is going to require more subjects to do. Okay, so uh, here's uh, the other situation, top right. Ordinary looking guy, well, he commits a swindle. And so now I'm gonna say that the subjects are gonna give on average a little higher um, number of months in prison, 6.4 months. Okay, interesting. That, that's that's. I, I say that because I, you know, probably swindles. People would sympathize with someone being victimized, maybe in a robbery. Depends upon the description. Uh, in the robbery, there, you know, maybe possible for the person to get back what was lost through insurance. But a swindle is a, a little bit more of a, a painful crime. So we'll, we'll say that probably the um, amount, number of months in jail is a little higher. Okay, so that's what happens here for Mr. Ordinary, all right? Now what happens for Mr. Attractive? Well, let's go with robbery. Now, if it's a robbery, I've said before that being attractive works in your favor. 
And so I'm going to say, if previous research supports me, that you that subjects would give an attractive guy a uh, less amount of time in jail. So I'm going to give them a mean of 2.2 months, and that would go along with the research, as I see. However, again, if the research is right, it's going to look like this. If you can lower right-hand corner, tra attractive guy who commits a swindle, now I think the subjects are going to get out there. You know, some of that uh, attractiveness, envy, and I think that they are going to give that person What's going on here? Longer amount, the longest amount of time in jail, ten and a half months. All right, so what do we call that? more conditions. We've got more data here. Now, how do you analyze this? I mean, because uh, if I mean, I've described it as we've gone along, but if you were to just look at this, okay. you might not say, "Oh, it's obvious what's going on here." And as we get more subjects and more conditions. It, it does become less obvious what's going on. Now this, by the way, is a two by two factorial design, right? And that's pretty straightforward. There are two independent variables, two conditions, uh, two levels of each. I could look at a third thing. For example, these are all pictures of, not myself, these, this, these are obviously the gender here, is male. What if I were to take these four conditions and reproduce them Another another time here, take all four of these. What if we looked at gender? So does this same pattern occur if the um, the robber or the swindler is female? Or is it even stronger? I mean, what, what are the reactions of subjects to a description of a crime and attractiveness if the robber Sorry. swindler? Is female. If I were to do that, I would have a two by two by two factorial design. And that's when things really get complicated. And that's when you, you've got to put things on the graph, which we'll do in just a minute. First, the uh, just to show you a little bit of the analysis that goes on here. One thing I would do is I would average across the uh, one of the independent variables. Okay, what's that called? That, uh, Attractiveness. Of the what is that? Right? So if I smash together the robbery and the swindle, people. in other words, I average 5.1 and 6.4, I'd get an average of 5.8 months in prison. And then if I smash together these two, and I just looked at attractiveness, and um, it would be kind of funny, right? Because I would see, I would average together 2.2 and 10.5, and I'd get an average of 6.4, which if you look at that, and by the way, this is called the main effect of attractiveness. If I looked at these averages and I forgot about crime or type of crime for a minute, 5.8, 6.4, I mean, it looks almost like attractive people get more time in jail. Although 6.4 is not that much higher than 5.8, it almost looks like, if you look at this data, that um, you know there's no difference, that attractive people are not afforded uh, less time right, in jail. So that's kind of funny the, um, if you look at that sort of data from just that one main effect. All right, but let me, oops, let me move this back. There. Um, but we can do the same thing with the um, attractiveness. We can sort of collapse across that. If I average 5.1 under robbery and 2.2, these two groups, in other words, 30 subjects here, 30 here. I would get a mean of 3.7. And if I did the same thing, the, these two columns on the right, swindle, and attract, swindle ordinary and swindle attractive, get a mean of 8.5. Now I'm looking at what's called the main effect for prime. So these outside means are called main effects. And here it becomes clear that swindlers get more time in jail than do robbers. Or just rubbers. <laughs> okay, so is that what's going on? So what is there something here? more subtle going on? Yeah, Does it look like right. simply that if you swindle, you get more time in jail than if you just do a robbery, but if you're attractive or not, it doesn't really matter. Well, that's what it sort of looks like if you look at it this way. But if you were to plot the data, then of course you would have to perform an analysis of variance. Okay, that would be your statistical technique. 
hang in there. Uh, we'll get to the interesting part here, though I guess I've already given it away. Uh, this would be uh, hypothetical results, right? Effect of attractiveness and type of crime on length of sentence. That's my lengthy scientific sounding title. Okay. On the bottom is one of the independent variables, in this case I'll go with type of crime, robbery and swindle. Over here on the, we always put the dependent variable on the left y-axis. And as you can see, what this suggests is that if it's a robbery, the bluish here are ordinary looking people. Um, if it's a robbery, then ordinary people get longer sentences than attractive people, red. But if it's a swindle, then the red, the attractive people spend a longer time. Okay, that's, that's that. So, what's the point of doing this? What's the point of me giving you the briefer on the factorial design? Studying the effect of multiple factors as opposed to just one cause. I mean, in RCTV, you're looking at just one thing, you know, and comparing it with control, seeing that, uh, you know, when you're comparing it with control condition, just to make sure everything else controlled, now this factor would cause this effect or not. Just looking at one factor. Yeah, so there's no so way. Factors and interactions. So, exactly. In an RCT, there's very limited number of conditions, right? So your arm might be the whole intervention, right? Everything, all the different pieces together compared to nothing, right? So if it has an effect, you have no idea why. But you can't break it down. And in an RCT, the only way to break it down is to add another arm without that component, right? So you have all of the mindfulness thing, Maybe you compare it to, well, what do you think is the important component? So say you want to look at, I don't know, um, number of sessions. You think, do I need eight sessions? Maybe I can do four sessions. So you have to have one arm with the full eight sessions and another arm with everything equivalent and four sessions. That's the only way you can look at that. And you have to do a full RCT, right, mm -hmm. to do that. And you probably need a control condition to make sure that, you know, it's not just the passage of time or whatever. Um, so you usually are limited to two or three arms, you know, unless you do something ridiculous like the match study. Um, and the objective is to compare the experimental conditions directly to each other, right? So there's no way of looking at components at the same time, multiple components, and isolating their effect. You just can't do it, right? But you can in the factorial design. So the objective is you don't actually compare individual conditions to each other, right? He wasn't comparing, you know, one corner to the other. You're averaging across conditions and isolating factors, and I'll show you how that works. So this is just, again, to highlight the difference, right? So everyone has hopefully seen this. This is like your RCT flowchart for two-arm parallel RCT, right? So you randomize people, they get this intervention, or they get that intervention, that's it, right? And then you follow them up over time. Now the factorial is a little different because it doesn't allow for repeated measures in the analysis. So you have to look at, like in his example, it was just a one-time measure of the sentence they got. So we have to look at a change score, maybe. Right, is our measure of our outcome, how much it changed, but it's, it's still doable. So here's our factorial design, and we're going to look at it in a different way. <clears throat> so this is the same thing. So the th two questions you have is, which is better aerobic or resistance exercise, and what if they do it at home or um, in a group, an in-person group? So you've got these different groups, right? And another way to represent it is in a chart like this. So you've got group one, two, three, four, so you one, two, three, four. And group one does aerobic exercise at home. Group two does aerobic exercise in a group. Group three does resistance at home. And group four does resistance in a group. Um, so you can have fewer people um, in each condition. And when you add them all up together, you have enough people for your analysis. I'm going to show you why. Uh, OK. So if I combine groups, remember I said you don't look at the individual groups against the other ones, you combine groups. So if I combine groups this way, and I compare the orange people, I add them all together, and I compare them to the green people, what am I comparing? Which factor is being compared of the two? Exactly. I'm comparing everyone who had aerobic to everyone who had resistance when I group them this way. But I can also group them, oops, I can also group them that way. Then what am I comparing? Then you're comparing the location. You're comparing the average outcome of people who do it at home to people who do it in a group, right? And I haven't had to do two different experiments to do that. Right. I've done it all at once. It's like brilliant, right? It is brilliant. Um, and you can take it to another level. So I actually wrote a grant. <coughs> I never, I, it, it got past the 
LOI uh, stage, but we never actually ended up submitting it. But I wanted to try this. So I have three factors now. Three, so it's a two, it's a three by two. Three factors in each have two levels. So my question was, for the mindfulness program, what happens if we do four versus eight weeks? Do we really need to do eight weeks? What if we do four, four weeks? And another question is, do people really need to practice at home for you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes, which is what we typically do? What if we just assign you know, 40 minutes to one group and 20 minutes to another group, so short versus long practice? And the other question is, how important is the yoga? You know, Because some programs don't even do yoga, they just do the mindfulness, and we just we have absolutely no idea. So the idea was, OK, we're going to look at each of these factors all together in one experiment by dividing people into these four groups, or these eight different groups, based on the different values of each thing. So for example, condition one, it's a four week program where they do short home practice and yoga. Condition two is a four week program where they do long home practice and yoga. Condition three is a four week program, they do a short home practice without yoga. Now you see how we're building this with the components? Condition four is a four week practice, long, a four week session, long home practice without yoga. So we build these eight different conditions, and then here they are again, and if I break them up this way, and I, I add up everybody in these conditions, condition one to four, and I collapse them, condition five to eight, what am I comparing? I'm comparing everyone about four weeks to everyone about eight weeks, regardless of whatever else they got. So by adding together all the subjects in those four conditions, I can get a big sample size, right? And so I know who did better, the four weeks or the eight weeks. And what if I do it that way? What am I comparing? So it's the same people, the same scores, same experiment, but it's addressing a different question now when I group them. So now I'm asking the question around practice time. So by grouping conditions 1, 3, 5, and 7, lump them all together, and compare them to 2, 4, 6, and 8, I can now answer the question, which is better, a long home practice or a short home practice? And then I use the same participants again, the same study, and I can answer the third question by grouping them this way. Same people, right? So what question am I asking if I lump them together this way? Yeah, so I compare, I add together groups one and two, groups five and six, compare them to three, four, six, and eight, and that answers my question. Which is better, the yoga or the no yoga, right? It's brilliant. I should write that grant again. <laughs> yeah, I got really excited when I learned about this maybe five years ago, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to do a study like that. Um, the interesting thing about this uh, this model is that as you increase the number of factors involved, you know, with each factor involved, your your condition number of conditions or the groups that you're comparing increases exponentially. It doubles. So that's why they. So I didn't do it, but the next step is a fractional factorial. So say we add in a fourth factor. It'll be like 16 conditions. It would be, but what they do is they don't do all 16. You do half of them. You still can do eight, but you pick and choose among your 16 possible yeah, combinations. Yeah. So you don't have every possible combination. Oh, yes. You can choose, say, like two groups that hit each of the four things. This reminds me of my vineyard study that I did in my PhD. Vineyard study? Yeah, I mean, the vineyard study is part of my thesis. So I had like 28 videos for people to choose from. The pool had 28 videos, and everyone could pick like eight videos. So that was also based on these conditions. Like, you know, we had like four factors and we had 32 videos. We and it, four. But it wasn't fully crossed? No. <laughs> it wasn't. Couldn't have been, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is a full factorial of two by three. Yeah. I guess it's a three by two because usually you say conditions by level. Yeah. Um, and it's full factorial because every condition is crossed with every level. Yes. But you can do the fractional factorial and do four. So I could add in, in one experiment with the same, almost the same number of people, I could look at the duration of the program, I could look at the length of the practice, I could look at whether or not yoga is there, and I could do individual versus group, which is the other thing I was interested in. And then you have to look at the combinations and make sure they actually make sense, that it's possible to do, you know, like a four week short practice with yoga on your own, right? You have to make sure everything's possible. And then you have to actually create, you have to create programs, right? So I would need to make eight different programs. So that, that part was a little strange. But this was for online, actually. This was supposed for online mindfulness. So it was based on the, our, this was right. supposed to be the study right after Kristen's thing. Right. 
right? So we did the eight-week program, but we really we wanted to optimize it, right? And why wouldn't you? So you can optimize the online program much more easily than you could an in-person program, right? So that was the idea, and maybe we should resubmit a study like this, because it actually, I put it into CCSRA and PAC grants, and it passed the um, letter of intent, but then it was the same thing. There were so many letters going in, mm -hmm. and such a broad um, sort of competition, I just didn't think they would get it, <laughs> because it wasn't mm -hmm. the type of reviewers who would get the design issues, right, necessarily. But um, they're starting to fund these these types of grants in the states more, you know, in some of the institutes in that. So does that make sense, how you could use that to optimize? I think a current match design can be easily do where to, so it's like Tai Chi versus mindfulness and randomized versus preference based. But we're not, yeah, I wonder if we could, um, I mean, that's kind of the way we're analyzing it too. We should try and represent it that way. <laughs> well, that's only four groups though, so what's the, how do we get eight groups? What's the third thing? Does it fit? Uh, not really. So we've got the yeah, intervention. Wait, 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 not wait list. No, no, that's just for the control. That's that's the, yeah. Yeah. Preference, type of intervention. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, preference versus randomized and uh, type of intervention. No, you're right that wait list is the third factor, isn't it? Uh, I guess not because that's... See, it's hard. It's kind of um, some weird hybrid thing. But it is two by two factorial when you look at intervention because intervention is crossed. with randomized versus preference. It's just that people aren't randomly assigned. You know, so there is a, I, I haven't talked about it yet, when we get into preference-based designs, there's a preference-based design where people are randomized to get their preference or, or be randomized. <laughs> yeah. It's called the doubly, I can't remember what it's, it's got a name. <laughs> anyway, so I think this is really quite brilliant using this type of factorial design to optimize your interventions because when you run the numbers, it can be done much more economically, and you can look at all those factors at once, and nobody really is doing this, right, in these types of interventions, sort of uh, multi-component behavioral oncology interventions, you don't see people trying to optimize so, their interventions. So for example, sorry, I'm just repeating this example from Matt's study. So when, when we get to know like which of these two interventions is better, we can further break it down into a factorial design to find out what is it about that intervention that makes it better than the other. You'd have to do another study, yeah, yeah. but you could. I mean, and that's kind of what this idea with this was, that we know the mindfulness works, but we don't really know what the, like, the idea with optimization is that you're trying to maximize efficiency, right? You know, you want to do the, the most effective thing, the, most, the cheapest that you can, like the cheapest and the fastest and the most efficiently, right? Without, you know, so if a four-week program has similar results to an eight-week program, then why would we do an eight-week program, right? You know, if people can practice for 20 minutes and get the same benefit as practicing for 40 minutes, then more people are likely to practice for 20 minutes, you know? And if they have to do yoga, it would be good to know that. Mm. Otherwise, they don't have to do yoga. <laughs> um, so then that's the optimization phase, and then once it's optimized, you go into the evaluation phase, and everybody has seen this. This is your, probably, has everyone seen this? Consort diagram? Yeah. Um, so this is your, your typical randomized controlled trial where you have to, you know, keep track of the number of people that you screen, um, the number who are ineligible, why they're ineligible, the number you that consent and who end up getting randomized, right? And then you've got your two boxes, people allocated to this intervention, allocated to that intervention, you know, how many actually did the full intervention, how many um, dropped out, how many were lost to follow-up, how many are in your analysis, right? So that's pretty standardized. Uh, I wasn't going to spend a lot of time talking about this. Um, but then the next topic is adaptive randomized control trials. Um, and I have another video. There we go. And this guy is going to tell us, uh, this is a pretty good overview of adaptive trials, what they are and uh, why they might be important. <laughs> My name is Roger Lewis, and I'm a senior medical scientist at Berry Consultants. Today I'm going to talk about what clinicians should know about adaptive clinical trials. 
When one designs a clinical trial, there's always substantial uncertainty at the beginning regarding how best to treat subjects in the experimental arm, uncertainty in the best dose of the drug, the duration of treatment, or exactly what the target population should be. So that uncertainty creates uncertainty regarding what the optimal trial design would be. Yet within a traditional approach to clinical trial design, all the key clinical trial parameters that are determined at the beginning of the trial are held constant during the trial execution. Essentially, the trial design you start with is the trial design that you carry through to the end. This leads to increased risk of a negative or a failed trial, even if the treatment is inherently effective. And in fact, perhaps a failed trial, when it <coughs> fails to give a clearly positive or a negative response, is the worst possible outcome after the investment in a clinical trial. However, once patients are enrolled in a trial and their outcomes start to become known, information is accumulating that reduces uncertainty regarding the optimal treatment approaches. Adaptive clinical trials are designed to take advantage of this accumulating information by allowing modification to the trial parameters in response to accumulating information and during the course of the trial according to predefined rules. So this is the by taking advantage program. of this partial information, this allows us to create a smarter trial and lower the chance of a failed trial. This is a, a cartoon that's taken from JAMA back in 2006 that simply shows that an adaptive trial differs from a traditional trial in that there are multiple paths that can be taken from the beginning of the trial, shown by the oval at the top, to the end of the trial, and it is in fact the data that accumulates within the trial itself that determines which path is taken. So when we talk about an adaptive clinical trial, we mean a trial in which we make planned, well-defined changes in key clinical trial design parameters during trial execution and based on data from that trial itself to achieve goals of validity, scientific efficiency, and safety. By planned, we mean that all the changes that we might make are defined a priori. By well-defined, we mean that the criteria for making those changes are planned. And by key parameters, we're talking about changing big things like the number of treatment arms, the dose that's used, or the timing of interim analyses, not minor inclusion or exclusion criteria, not the sorts of things that would fall under routine amendments. And we want to do this in a way in the, uh, so that we achieve scientific validity and can make reliable statistical inferences regarding the treatment effects observed within the trial. So this diagram shows the basic structure of an adaptive trial. We begin the data collection with an initial set of allocation and sampling rules. An allocation rule determines how the incoming patients are allocated to the various available treatment arms. And the term sampling rules refers to how many patients we enroll before we take a first look at the data. Once we have completed that initial period where we're using these initial rules, sometimes this is called the burn-in period, we analyze the available data, knowing full well that those data will be incomplete. Some of the patients, for example, may not have made their last study visit, or in fact, some of those data have not been queried yet, and there may be a small rate of errors within those data. We ask ourselves, based on the available information, whether a stopping rule has been met, and if no reason for stopping the trial, for example, because of evidence of harm or overwhelming benefit has been um, met, then we take the available information and we revise those allocation and sampling rules using whatever is the specific adaptive algorithm for the trial. We then continue that data collection and continue this circular process until one of the pre-specified stopping rules is met. One of the pre-specified stopping rules is always that we have reached the maximum allowable sample size for the trial and the stopping rule may dictate that the trial stops, or it may refer simply to stopping a phase or a stage of the trial, for example, in a seamless 2-3 design. The process of designing a clinical trial uh, using an adaptive approach has a number of characteristics that distinguish it from the design process for a traditional design. Because one has to consider the kinds of changes that might be made, we often attain greater clarity of goals for the trial. For example, we would need to determine whether we're trying to simply show proof of concept, meaning that there is some treatment effect, or we're trying to identify the dose of a drug uh, during a phase two trial that we're going to carry forward into phase three, versus trying to confirm a benefit that has been preliminary shown in learned phase trials. 
A statistically significant p-value is never the goal of an adaptive trial because it is so easy to generate a trial design that yields a statistically significant p-value but fails to answer the question of what the next stages ought to be in drug or device development. These designs typically take frequent looks at the data because the goal is to make data-driven modifications to the trial, and they are adaptive by design. We are pre-specifying the adaptations and the criteria for those adaptations with specific goals in mind. We are not making post hoc or ad hoc changes to the design. And because these trials are inherently more complex than a traditional trial, we use uh, computer simulation to understand the performance characteristics of the trial and to adjust the characteristics of the trial design to meet our goals for type 1 error control, power, or other operating characteristics. When comparing the characteristics of a traditional approach to clinical trial design to a flexible approach, there's a number of characteristics that generally help us distinguish the two. For example, in a flexible or adaptive approach, there's generally a greater number of interim analyses. We may use a variable randomization ratio as opposed to a fixed one-to-one -one or two-to-one randomization. We generally will have a larger number of experimental arms available to the trial so that we can explore the treatment space with uh, greater um, completion. We, we have a plan for using incomplete data that occurs during um, interim analyses to the best of our ability. And we often use either a Bayesian or frequentist approach, but we have a tendency to use a Bayesian approach to make the best use of partial data. And then as mentioned earlier, we're going to use computer simulation to understand the error rates of the trial. So why do we do, go to this additional work to do an adaptive and a fundamentally more complex trial design? We do this to avoid getting the wrong answer, to avoid drawing a qualitatively <coughs> incorrect conclusion, such as concluding that a drug doesn't work when in fact it has clinically important efficacy, or drawing the conclusion that it doesn't work because we didn't apply it in the right patient population. We also want to avoid taking too long to draw the right conclusion, too long in terms of the investment of time, the number of human subjects that are put at risk, or in the spending of scarce resources. When thinking about what are the areas of a trial in which there is an advantage to using adaptive approach, it's very useful for clinicians to think about uh, a concept we term anticipated regret. Anticipated regret is a mental exercise where you put yourself in the position of considering what you wish you had done differently if you knew your current approach had led to a failed trial, meaning a trial that failed to definitively answer the question that you are trying to ask. So a substantial fraction of all confirmatory trials fail despite promising learned phase results. Investigators and clinician experts can often anticipate the design decisions they wish they could take over after the trial fails, and those are the areas in which we want to design the adaptive trial to mitigate that risk. Now, there is a wide variety of adaptive strategies that we can bring to bear to create a more efficient trial with a greater chance of success. These include frequent interim analyses, longitudinal modeling, so we learn about the relationship between early and late endpoints, response adaptive randomization, where we change randomization ratios to preferentially randomize future patients to treatment arms that are either the most promising or about which we need the most information, explicit decision rules based on Bayesian predictive probabilities at each interim analysis, so we continue or stop a trial based on the predicted probability of an event in the future, such as the trial ultimately showing benefit. Dose response modeling, so we use the relationship between the treatment responses at different doses to reduce our uncertainty regarding the dose response. Or enrichment designs, where we focus on patient populations based on the data coming into the trial, so we enroll the patients most likely to benefit. And all of these approaches, however they're put together in a particular trial, need to be evaluated through extensive numerical simulation so we truly understand the trial's strengths, and its weaknesses. So coming back to this picture of the overall adaptive trial, how do we understand what's a good trial and what is a trial that is not yet ready to be implemented or has substantial uh, risks? We do that through a process called trial simulation. In trial simulation, we test drive the clinical trial design thousands of times by making assumptions about what the truth is 
regarding the patient population that's going to be enrolled, the accrual rates, the efficacy and safety profiles of the drugs. So we conduct the trial thousands of times, shown by the stack of uh, pictures, and we look at the average performance. How often does it get the right answer? How often does it get the wrong answer? And we look at the examples of single trials to see if at interim analyses, the decisions made by the adaptive algorithm seem ethically, clinically, and scientifically appropriate. It is by inspection of the output of extensive trial simulation that both statisticians and clinicians can understand the strengths and the weaknesses of the trial and understand what its performance should look like during the actual conduct of the trial. Because after all, the goal of this is to kill as few people as possible during the conduct of the trial and at the same time yield scientifically valid, reliable estimates of treatment effects. So in conclusion, not all trials need or should have an adaptive design. But when used appropriately, adaptive designs may improve efficiency and reduce cost, maximize the information obtained from the enrolled patient population, minimize risk to both the subjects and the sponsor. But to achieve this, the design decision should be based on objective performance rather than habit or tradition. And that objective performance uh, is evaluated via simulation. An adaptive design will not save a poorly planned trial or an effect, ineffective treatment, but it will help you more efficiently identify those treatments with true, true promise and minimize the efforts expended in testing treatments that are ineffective. Thank you very much. Um, so what do you guys think about all that? I have a question. Yes. I, I don't have research background at all, but is this more expensive, this uh, process? Well, you know, so I don't understand the simulation bit, to be quite honest, um, about how, you know, you test all these possible worlds and you choose the appropriate one. It should be cheaper okay. because the idea of the adaptation typically is to not need as many subjects as you your initial power calculation said you would in a traditional randomized. Um, but there's lots going on that he was talking about in there, right? Um, like this chart's useful. And it, it, to me, when I first learned about these, you know, um, I was like, well, it's like breaking all the rules that we learned, right. right? Like we learned, don't ever look at your data until the trial is done, right? Because that can um, lead to sort of confirmatory bias. And, you know, so it's like, it's like all the stuff you were told not to do. Don't ever change anything during a trial, right? That's cheating. You know, you're, you're biasing the results to come out the way you want them to, but this adaptive design, that's what it's all about, right? It's like, what can you do to bias the results that you're, or, you know, to, I mean, and it kind of makes sense, like this whole anticipatory regret thing, you know, it's like, you're like, even partway through the match, they're like, oh, we should have done this, or we should have done that, or, you know, we're talking now, like, if we knew more sophisticated ways to look at it, you know, there's this issue about people who refuse to be randomized to a wait list, you know, and so we end up losing them, like, well, what happens if you allow them to choose or something like that, you know, right. what we've done with a few people. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty interesting to me to think about um, the potential value of some of these adaptations in our trial. And I've got another video, she's going to talk about specific adaptations. Um, but here's some of the things we can adapt. And he, he alluded to some of these. So your randomization allocation. Um, and it's interesting that some of the things I've heard are the opposite of what you would think. Like I would think, oh yeah, if people are dropping out of one treatment more than another, then you want to assign more people to that treatment so your groups are equal at the end. Well, some of this randomization adaptation, they talked about, what was the word they used? Like maximizing, hi. Um, you know, maximizing benefit, right? So in some of the, the adaptations to the randomization allocation, what they're doing is putting more people in the treatments that are showing more promise. Right? So putting more people in the good ones and sort of even pruning out the bad ones, having more different options to start with. So this is if you want to think about what we talked about with the fractional stuff, right? Okay, so maybe you have to start with four or eight different combinations of your variables and you look at the data and you see all oh, the people in this group are doing terribly, then you get rid of that group and you start assigning people to the ones that are performing better, right? And so by the end, you've only got a couple left. Um, so the sample size recalculation um, piece happens fairly often, right? So you can go in and look at um, what the effect size is compared to what you thought the effect size was going to be, um, and then you can recalculate how many people you're actually going to need to 
have the conclusive evidence, right? So you can often finish your trial sooner. And I think that happens quite a bit. And then there's these other adaptive designs that are called group sequential adaptive designs. Um, so there's this phase two, three combined idea um, where you start with the phase two, which is sort of finding the elements of the intervention that are most useful and sort of once you've done that through partly through the trial, then you just focus on say the one that's most the combination that's most useful, and then you add in a control group and carry on with the same group from phase two into your phase three. And this pruning design is the idea of having a bunch of options and getting rid of the ones that don't work. So there's another video this lady talks about some of this stuff. Oops, on that one. <coughs> stage study design that uses accumulating data to decide how to modify aspects of the study without undermining the validity and integrity of the trial. This means you're going to enroll some subjects, look at their responses, and then make changes to the study, like increase the sample size, or stop randomizing to a treatment arm, or stop the study entirely. What you examine and change in the study defines what kind of adaptive design you're doing. As you can imagine, clinical trials are really complicated things, so that can cover a lot of ground. The clinical trials world has therefore settled on a few key designs. Adaptive randomizations, sample size recalculations, Bayesian just escalations, and group sequential studies. Now, the group sequential contingent includes seamless phase two threes as well as pruning designs, both of which are what people usually think of when they talk about adaptive designs. But don't be fooled. The others are perfectly legitimate, useful designs. They're just not as hip and trendy. So each of these <laughs> examines the result of one piece of the study as it progresses, and then makes changes based on what's observed. That's the key. The reason the group sequential type studies have gotten so much press is that these types of analyses look at outcomes in larger studies. So there's more potential for changes and theoretically more savings. The underlying concept behind the group sequential studies is that you have multiple interim analyses, but you still control the type one error rate. The savings happens because on average, you stop before you enroll all of your planned subjects. And on average, you need fewer subjects, but sometimes you need all of the planned subjects and that's a larger number than if you didn't have the interim analyses in the first place. So it works really well if you have the efficacy you expect, and it provides a nice hedge if the efficacy is a bit less than you expected. This general concept has been modified to create the seamless phase two, three studies. These studies start with multiple doses, have one interim analysis where you decide which is the best dose, and then you finish up with that dose and the control arm. It's well controlled and you can continue the subjects in your best arm with the, across the phase two and phase three and then combine all of that data together. So you get your first phase three study for fewer subjects. <coughs> There's additional savings in not having that downtime between phase two and phase three that we always have. The challenge is in knowing enough about your intervention that you can design your phase three before you've started your phase two. And that's a tall order for most new compounds. These studies are appealing because of the potential for large time and money savings, but really only work in a situation where you know everything except the dose. Now the pruning design is an adaptation of the group sequential that occupies the other end of the spectrum when you know hardly anything about the intervention going into phase two, and you need to do a lot of learn before you get to confirm. In these designs, you start with a range of doses and then do a lot of interim analyses to get rid of the arms that aren't as desirable as you go. In this case, desirability means efficacious, safe, easy to take, all of those things. The payoff for these designs is that you get to look at a lot more doses for the same number of subjects as a traditional phase two study, but you still get a lot of subjects in the doses with the highest potential. 
Now, the downside is that they're not well controlled, so we can't use these as a pivotal study in any way. Other, more traditional adaptive designs may not get the big headlines, but they can be just as useful in their own way. The adaptive randomization designs, for example, are widely used and do not cause nearly as much controversy. These designs look at the characteristics of a subject and then decide which treatment to randomize the subject to based on what the previous subjects with those characteristics have been randomized to. The adaptive piece here is therefore the randomization status. We make decisions on future randomizations based on what we've already randomized. The purpose is to keep the treatment arms balanced across the factors that might affect subjects' response to therapy. Now, this eliminates bias when we're estimating the treatment effect at the end of the study. We can be more sure that the effect we're seeing is due to the intervention and not big differences in, say, age between the two treatments. So it's like stratified randomization during the Sample trial. size recalculation designs serve a completely different purpose. These studies have really gotten a bad reputation in recent years, and honestly, some of it is well-deserved. From the FDA's perspective, increasing the sample size partway through your study just because you don't see the original treatment effect you planned is pretty much tantamount to cheating. The basic premise here is that you do an interim analysis and increase the sample size if the assumptions of your original protocol were wrong. And there are two different types. There's blinded and unblinded. Now the blinded version looks at pooled data like rate of events or variances. The unblinded actually looks at all of those plus the treatment effect. As you can imagine, the blinded is much more acceptable in terms of controlling your type 1 error since you're not even looking at your efficacy effect or testing any hypotheses. Statisticians often claim that if you are unsure of your assumptions going into a study, you should do a group sequential study. Um, that design is much more powerful than recalculating your sample size in the middle of your study. However, exactly how endpoints are going to turn out is much harder to predict than, say, next year's fashion. So even if you feel good about the placebo rate or the variance estimate that you choose at the beginning of the study, there's a lot that can go wrong, and you might be really off, which is where the sample size recalculations come in. The problem is when this method is used to save studies that were designed without forethought, and that's where the bad reputation comes in. Used cautiously, however, these designs can be yet another useful tool in your toolbox. So what have we learned in our adaptive designs introduction? One, no matter what kind of adaptive design you're doing, the critical thing is to identify what aspect of the trial you're going to review and then make changes based on that review. Two, make sure that the design you're using is going to give you what you need and not just be trendy. Just like her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so any comments or questions about that that clarify some of what the first guy was talking about? I'm wondering what the randomization, the rationale for randomization as you go along. So well, so, uh, that's, I think the way she described it is a little, it's, you don't, do that for each person okay. but what you would do is part way through you would look at I guess who was randomized to each group and maybe um, moderating effects of different predictors that you might stratify on I think uh -huh. um, so for example we might say at the beginning that we're gonna um, have stratified randomization on, on gender or sex right meaning that we want equal numbers of women and men in each group mm -hmm. um, you know, and I mean, that's not something you would probably do partway through, but there could be other things that you might discover partway through or affecting treatment outcome that you should be balancing among your groups that thought, you weren't, right? I thought that the original, like, the point of randomization in the first place was to balance out all the things you could possibly think of and then those that you couldn't even think of, so... Yeah, and I think the like, idea is here... large enough that these things are already balanced and you don't need to... So maybe not. I don't know. I'm, so I think like a good, a better example might be that. So you look at the data halfway through, and you notice that people who um, own pets have better response. You know, something that you didn't think of beforehand, right? I mean, maybe not own pets, but you know, there's some demographic or uh, geographical variable that seems to be related to treatment response. 
right? Mm -hmm. Something that you hadn't thought of before, but now you're finding it out. And so then you think, uh-oh, since we know about this, we better make sure our groups are balanced on that, on that right? So I think that's kind of, it's like covering your bases. Okay. Uh, yeah? I'm using Covaria adaptive randomization oh, at the moment. But you're the way ahead of us. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, so the reason I'm doing it is because, two reasons. Um, it's a continuous enrollment strategy, which means I can't stratify at the beginning. So like for sets, for example, uh, I can't stratify by sets because they're just rolling into the study continuously. I don't have this big group. Oh, because my inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria mean that the recruitment is quite difficult. So it means that I, because I can't stratify, instead of just completely randomizing into one of the other groups, I use a program that takes into account a couple of covariates and then will randomize to one of two groups based on what distance are in those groups at the moment. Oh, so that, that is an adaptive randomization. Yeah. Um, cool. And the other reason is because my eventual participant number is going to be quite small, so it isn't that huge. Mm. So things might be, like might be unbalanced, yeah, and if you already to, know... Yeah, to try and avoid unbalanced, like it being unbalanced in a couple of those covariates. But the problem is that you can't use all possible covariates for, right. but I've got sex, Asian... And that makes sense, because even in a small group, it's not that randomization will guarantee it won't no. be imbalanced, it's just that statistically it's less likely to be unbalanced. Yeah. yeah, so if you want to assure it, then you can use that kind of adaptive randomization that you're talking about. So. Mm -hmm. But it's not really... Well, I don't know, is it adaptive? Because you're not changing it as you go along. No, I don't change it as I go along. It just, it sort of calculates a score based on who's already in the group um, to what, so for the new participants. So it is taking into account data that's already collected, though. Yeah. 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 So it so is adaptive, I guess. Yeah. Because yeah. if you had just done it in advance and you had a certain randomization algorithm based on those three things, it would be more stratified. Yeah. Sort of so it just takes into account who's already randomized. And what their those kind of so it just are. Takes yeah. it a step for that. Did you like for that? No, I didn't. Enough? Enough? So I just taught myself. Well, I learned how I learned about taught myself about it, and then found an open source program that allows you to do it. But someone had written the code for it, yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's open source, which means that you can export it so that it's people can, it's transparent. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. So when he talks about imputation in all stages, is that the, like the, like, you know, the, how do they do the imputation? Like, well, I don't know too much uh, about all the statistic, you right. know, all this um, modeling he's talking about, right? Because they talk about, does anyone know what Bayesian is? I'm trying to start yeah. learning. <laughs> <laughs> it's really difficult. So I think the basic, so Bayesian is basically no, when you no. have a, when I you previously think, know yeah. about something, you make assumptions based on previous knowledge about, uh, you know, the, the previous knowledge about certain variables. Uh, so, um, you know, you create yeah. mathematical models based on whatever you know, how a certain level of variables play out in the world. Yeah, so, so it's... So, so if you collect more data, then your prediction gets better. Better and better. Yes. Time. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's the Bayesian part, but it's really, really fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of important in these sorts of designs, too, is, is using, if you're going to adapt, you use these sort of statistical techniques. Yeah. Right, that are you know like all this modeling they talk about too. That's that's able to you know predict all the possible outcomes if you change this thing or if you change that thing. Right, mm -hmm. pretty sophisticated. I was going to give some examples, you know, um, of uh, yeah that we don't need that chart right now. <laughs> I'll go up in a second. Of where I've actually so I really have just learned about adaptive trials in the last few years. Right, and didn't really know anything about them or that they even existed. But we did this. Uh, so it wasn't a true adaptive trial in mindset, right, because uh, it wasn't planned in advance. Um, but we did, in mindset, do a sample size recalculation partway through. So mindset was a study where we compared mindfulness-based cancer recovery, it's a three-arm trial, to supportive expressive therapy in a control condition. Um, and our statistician is Peter Ferris, and partway through we weren't sure if we are going to get our sample size, so we had... Um, you know, based on the effect size we got, we get our primary outcome, we had said we needed 300 people. And we were recruiting in Calgary and Vancouver. And, you know, we ran out, running out of money, running out of time, and we only had 200 and some odd, right? right? 270, I think we ended up with. And so Peter said, well, why don't we just go in and check our assumptions for the sample size calculation, right? So we didn't actually look at any of the outcomes. We, we had a, based our sample size on um, an interclass correlation, which is uh, because it's in groups. So cohorts within groups often respond similarly, and if there's that sort of cohort effect, then you have to up your sample size. So we had estimated a certain interclass correlation, and so he went and checked it for all the groups, and it turns out that 
the estimation we made was really high, right? And there really wasn't any ICC effect going on. So then he was able to recalculate the sample size based on that, and it was much lower. So he said, great, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we actually did that, right? Um, but not planning to do it in advance. In a true adaptive trial, you know, you have to say in advance all the different things you're going to do around adapting that. So another example, and that's what this chart is, we did it in I, I Can Sleep. Um, so this was a trial where we took cancer patients with insomnia and we put them into CBT, cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia or mindfulness-based stress reduction um, to treat their insomnia. And we did a lot of things right in this trial. We had clinically meaningful outcomes and effect sizes. But what we didn't know at the outset was that people were going to drop out at twice the rate from the mindfulness than the CBTI. Um, and partly the reason for that is because it was participants were blinded to treatment groups. So we were trying to, you know, a couple of classes ago when we saw the video on clinical trials, it was like participants are blind, they don't know what they're getting, you know, they, they don't have that sort of placebo effect. So we thought, well, maybe we could do that here by um, just telling them they were treatments for insomnia. So they had to have, they had to be cancer survivors with insomnia, and we said non-drug treatments for insomnia, you know, sign up here. And in the consent form, we didn't say what the treatments were, we just said, you may be doing things like keeping track of your sleep and doing relaxation exercise, very vague, right? So they didn't know what the two groups were, and they were assigned to one or the other, they didn't know what the other group was, right? So here's people with insomnia, they show up, some of them do CBTI, which is keeping track of your sleep, talking about your sleep, it's all sleep, 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 right? Other people, show up and they're told to meditate. <laughs> so what happened? We had a 50% dropout from the mindfulness group and like 15% dropout from CBTI, right? And so we had to adapt the randomization um, midway through and so we changed the randomization from one to one to two to one. So we had to randomize 64 into mindfulness and 47 to get equal sized groups at the follow up. So I think we ended up with 27. But if you look at, um, you know, the people who dropped out, like withdrawals, you know, people said all sorts of different things. Date, time, too busy, personal reasons, not interested, you know, my sleep's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, there was just way more withdrawals. And part of the, to the issue of blinding people, you know, and also um, recruitment, like a lot of people were ineligible, 27 people who had insomnia were ineligible because they'd already taken mindfulness. They'd already taken the program, right? So that basically ruled out anyone who was interested in mindfulness. You know, so we get all these people with insomnia who don't want to take mindfulness because they probably would have if they had, and then they're assigned to do it. Anyway, so that's an example where we should have thought in advance, right? Because we're blinding people, we should have planned some kind of adaptation in case our, um, if we had differential participation or dropout rate. So we did that, but it wasn't part of the original plan, right? But we made that adaptation anyway. Um, so then I thought about match, and I'm like, geez, what kind of adaptations should we have written into that? Because we had no, we have no idea what the preference is going to be. So people who have a preference for Tai Chi or mindfulness get their preferred group, but we have no idea what proportion would prefer each, and what proportion. And I think we actually did say this in the study protocol that what proportion would agree to be randomized. So there's two questions: How many will have no preference and agree to be randomized? Because we kind of wanted equal numbers in the randomized part and in the preference part, right? So the adaptation would have to be, you know, if blank percent or less agree to be randomized, we've got to shut down the preference arms or something. But we don't have a rule, and we, we should probably come up with a rule. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And so... I more people have a preference than not. Well, for sure, yeah. but is it is it... 60% have a preference, or is it 80% who have a preference? Do we even know that? No? Feels like 80. <laughs> so that's why we changed the wording. We noticed in the first couple of cohorts that everyone had a preference, and we were asking them, which one do you prefer? So now we ask them, are you willing to be randomized? Yeah. Before we ask them which one they prefer. <laughs> but at some point, we're going to have to... I think we should need to sit down and figure out what our adaptation is going to be. So we have to sit down and do what we should have done at the beginning and say, if after X number of subjects, okay, after X number of subjects, we're going to analyze data, right? And if our rates of preference versus randomized is, you know, below X or whatever, then we're going to do what? What are we going to do? 
right? And what if our preference is all Tai Chi and no mindfulness? What are we going to do, right? Do we want the arms to all be balanced in the end and we're going to change it to an only randomized trial? We would have sample size recalculation for match. Well, um, we should probably do that too, right? Because 600 is, is increasingly difficult, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think we need to, the match team needs to think about what adaptations should we have put into it at the beginning and make it much more concrete, like, okay, what exactly are we going to do when and how are we going to analyze data and what's our rules? Remember in his diagram he had the rules, the stopping rules? We need to develop rules, right? So any deviation from those rules would be an adaptation that lead us to adaptive design. Pardon me? Any, any deviation from the basic rules would lead us to adaptive design. Yeah, so, so anything that's not following the protocol. You know, and so really, in retrospect, it should have been written as an adaptive design because there were so many unknown things, right? We could have even pruned arms or something, you know, based on decision rules. And so if a certain treatment's not having an effect or it's not viable because people won't agree to it or they drop out, then we drop it or something, right? So we actually need to sit down and think about, okay, we're part way through the trial, but do we need to make certain adaptations? And if we're going to, we need to be much more systematic about it so we can write about it and say, well, you know, it really is an adaptive trial and this, these were the adaptation rules we mm -hmm. used. And, right? Other than, well, people stopped coming to this group and so then we changed this, I don't know when or for how many or, you know. <laughs> what right? do you think, what do you need to pre-specify for the sample size recalculation? Like when you'll analyze? You have to say when you're going to do it. Yeah. Um, and you have to say how, how many. Yeah, like after how many participants are you going to analyze and what are you going to look at? And then what value, what's your cutoff for? Pre -specify for the size, like yeah, different. yeah, exactly. Like you have to pre-specify what all your decision rules are. You know, so it's very clear. It's like yeah. one of those little decision trees. It's like, okay, after we have 200 people, we're going to look at, I don't know, what, what maybe what the effect size is or whatever the sort of important, maybe we just look at one variable see how people are responding, you know, and if it's, I don't know, you'd have to come up with a rule, I guess, right? You could recalculate the sample size based on the observed effect size versus the predicted effect size, right? You'd have to read more on how these things are meant to be done because it's fairly sophisticated statistics as far as I can see. So these, some of these adaptive trials, I was thinking, well, how do they fit with the factorial stuff we're talking Right, like those kind of pruning designs and the phase two, three combined ones, they're almost like I wonder if you could do a most sort of, uh, you missed Kirsty, the factorial mm -hmm. stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I can show you, are we out of time? So I think last class you were talking about like, the be really cool and amazing that people are doing. Yeah, well, so this is an example of a factorial design with three factors at two levels. So the idea is that you can do one study that looks at multiple component factors all together. Mm -hmm. So in this example, we're looking at the question of how long does the program need to be? And so we've chosen four versus eight weeks. Right. Uh, whether or not they need to do home practice, right? Or how much home practice they need to do. And you could this could be done versus however much. Like, you know, like if it's an exercise thing, you could look at like how many days a week they need to do. But in this case, it was 20 minutes versus 40 minutes of meditation practice at home. And then in, in this example, it was whether or not there's yoga in the program or if it's just meditation. So you can look at main effects and interaction effects. Yeah, so you have each condition is, say there's 20 people in each condition or however many, right? So each condition is different. So condition one, it's like a short program, a short practice that includes yoga. So each person is just in one condition, right? And so what they get is the, whatever combination of these things. And then in your analysis, if you group, you never look at groups independently, you, you lump them together. So you would add the results of everybody in the first groups one to four, groups five to six, and that's how you compare the effect, the main effect of program length, right? Mm -hmm. And then to compare the next thing, um, the effect of short versus long practice, you lump them together in this way. Mm -hmm. And then to do the effect of yoga or not, you lump them together in this way. So you're using the exact same participants, mm -hmm. right? And you're using them to answer three different research questions. So it's almost like you have three different experiments in one. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so it's much more efficient. Yeah. And so for this, would it be you wouldn't necessarily try to get an enormous sample, and it would be kind of still in there earlier phase yeah so the, like the signal and the note. yeah so these mostly fit in the when we go back to the orbit model right the phase or the, this is the most framework so this, this is where this is the pre kind of phase one and optimization is I think it happens in 1b or something like that where is it yeah it's 1b so this is 1B, basically. Oh, refine. Yeah. yeah. So it's where you do your treatment opti optimization. Yeah. That seems like a really efficient way to answer all of Yeah, it's pretty cool, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a little framework. And so you don't get to phase 3 until this box here. So the optimization, I think, really can happen in phase 1B and phase 2 as well. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, questions? Is this relevant? Is proof of concept in there, like after, what about that first diamond thing there? Expect this one here? Yeah, like, is that where proof of concept would fall? Yeah, yeah, basically that would be the phase two before, and the, in, in this framework, for the evaluation is more randomized controlled trials, like efficacy trials. Mm -hmm. So it's like a decision tree, right? So if you haven't been able to show that proof of concept that you've optimized the intervention with the best treatment components, you know, and if you remember from the earlier phases, you're already picking your treatment target, you know, defining it very clearly what it's got to be. And so if you're, you can't find a combination of components that gets you there, then you go back, right? Nope, start over. <laughs> right. Yeah, and then all the factorial stuff. You missed the video. Yeah. Was it good? Well, <laughs> <Did> it <trend? laughs> like I wasn't trying to either. <laughs> You have big hair, though. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the example. When people are trendy, what? So this is an example with a, a, a two by two, mm -hmm. a little simpler one where you have four groups. So mm -hmm. here we're looking at aerobic versus resistance exercise done at home or in a group setting, right? So again, you group them this way to answer the type of exercise, and you group them that way to answer the location question for the same participants. So it's still pretty cool. How many variables would feasibly be looked at within one study? Because three already is getting to be Well, so I didn't get into it, but you can do what's called fractional factorial. So say you get to four variables where you need 32 conditions. Yeah. Is it 32? I think so. Four by three. Two by three. For how many conditions? Oh, that's, sorry. I'm just trying to figure out how many you need in, with four. You need 16. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you had four. Yeah, there will be 16 conditions. So four what variables. you can do is that the... Um, fractional factorial, so that you don't fill in every condition. Mm -hmm. So you have participants strategically and say half of them. Mm -hmm. So you can still, so instead of having four groups that have each of the variable levels, you might only have two, right? right? So, you know, you might, for example, if you added in an extra variable and you had 16 possible combinations, <coughs> you might skip every third one or something, right, for each variable. So you'd still get every combination. Um, and you'd still be able to combine groups. So, like, if there's 16 of them, you don't need eight groups that have each level, right? So you can have four groups. You can set it up so that um, for each comparison, there's still four groups that are combined. They're just different yeah, combinations, yeah. right? So that's a fractional factor. So not every cell is full. And I could show you a picture of that. I thought that was going a bit over. <laughs> but it's a pretty cool way to answer lots yeah. of questions in one study really efficiently, right? But then again, and we had talked about this too, this example here was from a grant I had written, and this was an online mindfulness program. So it would be way easier to make all these eight different conditions online, but if, say, you were doing it in person, like you'd have to have eight different groups, and the instructor would have to be able to deliver a four-week session and an eight-week session with, you know, yoga included or yoga not included, and all the other things you might want to mm -hmm. vary, right? So this works better for um, kind of programs maybe that people are doing on their own or that are internet based or, you know, kind of um, home exercise programs, okay. right, where you can tailor information. Like the, the, some of the examples I see are around um, healthy eating things or smoking cessation things, right? So there's so many components that could be in your smoking cessation program and it's easy if they're sort of delivered to a person by computer, it's easy to mix and match the components. Mm -hmm. So it works really well for those kinds of studies. 
Okay. Is there any other comments? This is posted online, so if you want to go back and watch the videos, you can uh, see them. I liked her. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, the last thing was any other examples. And Rosie's is a good example too. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to be doing any um, interim analyses? No, I, I do wish I'd pre-specified the sample size calculation because my sample size calculation is based off like a change in fatigue pre and post and intervention. But I'm not convinced that the pre that they actually had like clinically relevant fatigue, mm -hmm. and so the change would actually be less. So Smaller, yeah. Stuff. Mm -hmm. And so maybe more people. Like, then, like, yeah, so I might not need as many people because mine are starting fatigues, like mm -hmm. clinically, and so there may potentially. Oh, so your change. participants are more fatigued than yeah. yeah, yeah. So they might be more of a change, but then I've got not much to base that on. So we'll see. Well, maybe you can stick in and pair of analysis somewhere. Yeah. What the effect size just to see what the effect size is, and then I could reduce my sample size. Yeah. Just because it's going to be so hard. That's what we did in MAT, in mindset. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't actually look at the primary outcome. We looked at the other assumptions for the sample size, which was, and we had an inflation factor in it because of that ICC, right? And so once we took out that inflation factor, we already had enough people. So we didn't check the effect size to see if it was what we thought it would be. Other examples, questions? So when drugs have different dose, I think like 30 milligrams, 40 milligrams, yeah. I think, I think this design, yeah, it must be like, okay, if the patient's not responding to 20 or 30, you just move them here. So, it's harder when yeah, it's multiple components it's, and they're not, you're not yeah, just yeah. upping a dose, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think we have a break for a month now. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, I think the next class isn't until... Where are we now? 14th? Yeah. Yeah, so March 14th, right, is the next one. Because March 7th, wait a minute. Oh, I'm not online. Is uh, APS. Yeah. Yep, so we get a break. Because next week is family day, and then I'm away the week after that, yeah, and then I go to APS, so it's um, the 14th. So you guys will we'll probably send out a reminder. Okay. To schedule. Um, any other traction related things before we go? I was just showing Christy um, a way to spend your money if you haven't yet. There's a, a grant workshop coming up next week, mm -hmm. grant writing workshop. It is very expensive, but if you're not spending your training money, um, you could do that. It's like 600 well, US. Well, I think I will be spending my money. But yeah. Yes, be a damn good workshop. <laughs> yeah. I know, it's ridiculously expensive, right? And it's weird they're offering it to the university, but the university not subsidizing it or anything. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like a yeah. bit of a scam. Yeah, I hope it's good. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I think they're offering a grant. Yeah, really. Telling it's, the um, it's, grant. <laughs> it's just some woman, Maria S. Formas, has extensive academic career with UVic, Harvard, Massachusetts, extensive record of grant procurement. I mean, like for us, one day you could do a workshop like how to apply for grants and apply for grants and apply for grants and written so many the class. So oh, I that could. would be good yeah. enough for us. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe she something. I don't know. Maybe she she's from Harvard and yeah. Boston. There's always more to learn. There's always more to learn. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that would be good, actually. All right. Well,